This is The Look, the latest in the war between two Australian motoring icons. Ah, the Ford Falcon, loved by generations of Australian motoring enthusiasts. But in the late 90s, Ford released the AU Falcon, which had a much more polarising design. And I just so happened to have bought one off a of Facebook marketplace pretty cheap. It's got a few problems, but let's see exactly what I got. This is what 1200 Australian or about 780 US dollars got me, an SPAC Ford Series 2 AU Falcon. The seller also included 3 months registration, saving me about $220. It's in need of some work, both cosmetically and mechanically. The boot has clearly got water making its way inside, causing the metal to expand, rusting its way through. My guess would be the water is coming in through the spoiler mounting holes, as it's barely held on. And aside from some light hail damage on the roof, this is pretty much the only dent in the bodywork. The interior is a rather radical departure from Falcons of the past. Lots of curves and smooth edges. And even with the front seats all the way back, there's still plenty of room for passengers in the rear. With this being the S-Pack version, it has a lot of nice features as well. The six-speaker sound system also features a six-stacker CD player. On the outside, there's also 16-inch alloy wheels and a sports suspension. And when it comes to safety, it has both driver and front passenger airbags. And like most modern cars today, there are controls for music as well as cruise control right on the steering wheel. Some other quirky details are these adjustable seatbelt heights. I don't think I've ever actually seen that on a car before. The headlight controls are not on the turn signal stalk, but to the right of the dash cluster. And last of all, right next to the sunglasses holder are a pair of tiny navigation lights that can be adjusted just like in an airplane. Apart from the interior needing a bit of a clean, the only real damage is where to the driver's seat. But what's under the hood? We've got a 4 litre inline 6 engine. By the way, this car had previously sat practically undriven for the last 6 years. But prior to its sitting, the previous owner had fit new bearings, brake rotors, pads, rear axle bearings, a fuel filter, window regulators, diff oil, hoses and flush the cooling system. But all is not well, as we'll get into shortly. When I purchased this car, the tank was nearly out of fuel, so I filled it up with 98 and threw in some injector cleaner. I also noticed that the old windshield wipers were very brittle and needed replacing. Using old blades is a good way to really scratch up your glass. A new pair were cheap and very easy to install. As with any car I get, I give it a basic clean. And I found wheel rim cleaner works well to brighten up the alloys. Leave it on for several minutes, then brush or rinse off. Oh! And boy does it smell bad. And I bought this car knowing that the engine runs rough sometimes, according to the Facebook Marketplace ad. And when it warmed up, it would start to misfire, and it idle often stool. There are many potential causes for this, so we've got a lot of problem solving to do. Now with the body clean and dried, I began touching up some of the damage with rust converter, and for now I'll simply paint over the rust I need to fix up later. One important thing to fix was the seemingly faulty brake light switch, which when pressed lightly would come on, but when pressed harder would go out. This is an easy fix requiring the replacement of the brake light switch located on the foot pedal itself. There is one connector to detached, then on the back there is a yellow pin to take out. The piece then comes out with a bit of wiggling. Would have been easier getting under the dash if I was a bit more flexible. And the brake lights now work correctly. But now we've got to turn our attention to the front lights. They are both quite dim for some reason. Pulling out the connector from the back of the globe reveals that a bit of melting has definitely happened. This video was made possible thanks to today's sponsor Ugreen and their 45 watt charger. The Ugreen Nexode Mini covers all of your needs for charging portable devices, from mobile phones to wearables, tablets, and even light laptops. Charge two mobile devices at full speed simultaneously. That 45 watt will split to 25 watt on the top port and 20 on the lower one. Not only that, the Ugreen power dispenser system intelligently adjusts the power output to protect your device's battery, helping it to last longer. This tiny charger uses gallium nitride technology, so it's much smaller and produces far less heat than conventional chargers of the past. To find out more, check out the link in the description description to up your charging game, and big thank you to Ugreen for sponsoring today's video. And I'm going to need more room to replace the connector, so out comes the air intake system held in place by several 10mm bolts. Now the old connector could be snipped right off. With some help from my father, we soldered on the new connector. An extra pair of hands really helped in this relatively tight space. I cover the new joints with heat shrink with a small blowtorch to make sure nothing shorts out. The light is very bright once again, even the other headlight is now a lot brighter. I then put the airbox back in, but little did I know, I'd be taking it out many more times. While the lights were bright once again, the passenger side lens was very fogged over, and using an inexpensive cleaning kit I had lying around, I polished the surface a few times, then once clean and dried, I sprayed on the sealant, which made a huge improvement. 
The next improvement the car needed was a properly attached spoiler, and after locating the brake light connector and removing several bolts, the part came off. This is where the water was likely getting through the hole for the brake light connector. The other side was equally dirty and seemed to have been patched up as well. Underneath the tape was a sizable hole and some rust. I was now concerned just how the other side was going to look. Turns out, not much better you could say. With the area cleaned off, I then touched up the area with some rust converter, sanding the surface back before applying more rust converter. The rust I temporarily painted over before was due for an inspection. It wasn't all that good as you can see here. Water had sat in the boot cavity for some time making the metal turn into this. But never fear isopropyl alcohol was here and with the surface sanded back and cleaned off, I started applying some rust converter to the surface. I also cleaned out the inside of the boot and sprayed a ton of rust converter in there as well. While this method might seem pretty crude, you've got to remember that this is a low value old car and it isn't worth putting too much time and effort into the cosmetics. But I'll do what's necessary to get the spoiler on nice and securely. And in addition to the bolts, I'll also use some strong double sided mounting tape. This will add some good cushioning to the spoiler. And before I remove both sides of the tape, I will test fit the part, making sure it's still lined up correctly. Then the fun peeling action could begin. It lined up pretty straight thankfully. The last thing to do was tighten the bolts. I was hoping the car would simply start working again correctly, like maybe being left with no fuel for years had clogged something up. And for a bit of time, it did seem to be the case. But once warmed up, it started misfiring bad. Then when I was coming to stop, the engine simply stalled. So we still had a mechanical problem. So what next? First of all, our cheap scan tool wouldn't connect to the car. The previous seller mentioned this happening to them as well. So for now, we'll have to use the shotgun method and start trying parts that often cause misfires and idling issues. The first being the crank angle sensor located in the front of the engine block. It's a cheap part and something that does eventually require replacing in these cars. This part sits in the groove and relays crankshaft timing information to the computer. I was thankfully able to fit the part without needing to remove the fan assembly. Then the bolts could be tightened back up. This part can last the lifetime of the vehicle, but it's not uncommon for them to fail within 200,000 kilometers. So let's see whether the new part actually works. The engine won't start with the crank sensor missing. This car will also never start straight away when cold. You've got to attempt to start it, turn it off, then crank it again. Also, be sure to secure the bonnet struts when you've got a light hanging on it. So as we can see, the part is in and is definitely working since the car started. So I took it out for a test drive. Once warmed up, it's still to the lights. Problem not resolved. Thankfully, there are many things that can cause idle problems and misfires. A part many forum threads point to is the coil pack. This generates a spark that fires the spark plugs in the engine. The ignition leads and spark plugs themselves are actually new so I can rule out those being issues. And with some of the intake assembly removed I can get a better look at the coil pack itself, underneath the air intake manifold. There are three bolts that I needed to remove. You'll definitely need several socket extensions to reach this far down. Or you could take the whole intake manifold out, but that sounds like a lot more work honestly. But with some persistence and a lot of wiggling I got the old coil pack out. Aside from it being dirty it has no signs of cracks or any obvious damage. I managed to place the new one back in, but putting the leads back onto the pack and in the correct firing order was a real challenge. So once again the air intake can be put back on. The car hadn't been started for a while so on the first crank it once again didn't start. But the second, it predictably did. I did notice some corrosion on the battery terminals as well, so why not clean those off too? After removing the negative, then positive terminals in that order, I scrubbed the terminals with hot water and baking soda, followed by a wire brush. When reseating a battery, make sure to install the red positive terminal first. So did the new coil pack fix our issue? Well, it didn't. The car would still misfire under load when warmed up and when idling the engine would often stall. Next I thought I would try cleaning the throttle body and mass airflow sensor. This controls the amount of air let into the engine when the accelerator pedal is pushed. To clean it you don't have to take it off, however I wanted to access the MAF sensor located just behind the throttle body. This part tells the engine how much air is actually getting in. It can get clogged with carbon and debris so I repeatedly sprayed it with some isopropyl alcohol, then with some air. The throttle body could then be cleaned out using some carby cleaner. After letting it soak in for a few minutes, be sure to wipe all the residue away and apply lubricant to the hinge on either side. I then reassembled the throttle body. Be sure that nothing falls into the intake manifold either. The car still started relievingly. 
pretty fast as well without cranking the motor for long. Perhaps this has something to do with all that isopropyl alcohol I sprayed on the MAF sensor. Long story short, that didn't fix the problem, but it could be a fuel delivery issue and my father helped me to remove the old fuel filter. There was one put in back in 2016, but the car sat undriven for most of that time, so a new one was good to put in anyway. If a car is hard to start or has intermittent acceleration, you could be looking at a failing fuel pump. This one is original. I disconnected its power source and ran the car to get it to burn off any fuel remaining in the system. After it eventually conked out, I could remove the hoses without much worry of fuel spraying everywhere. Then it was a matter of loosening this bolt which needed some WD-40 to get moving. Then with a hammer, the seal could be removed. And big thanks to my father for really helping me out with this part. Then the pump assembly can be taken out. The new pump was then installed and all hoses connected. The car then started very easily and from here on out it started easily every time, so the pump was definitely failing, but this didn't fix the main issue. Another part that can cause idling issues is the idle speed control valve, located on top of the throttle body. It looked partially jammed closed, the spring is supposed to keep it open when no signal is sent to it. I thought I'd also clean out the airflow holes with some carby cleaner. Clearly there was some sort of buildup. After scrubbing the valve with a q-chip, I put it back in and started up the car. It was seemingly idling much better now. So I took the car for a long drive on the highway, but once warmed up at highway speed the engine began misfiring again quite badly and that was definitely a bit unnerving. Luckily. I was able to pull over and think for a bit. But I had to get the car home even though it was constantly misfiring the whole time. Then I had an idea. I knew the computer was in the passenger footwell, maybe it was overheating. So I put the AC on in the footwell and what do you know, it started driving without issue, no stalling or misfires. So I was confident enough to drive the car to KFC to get a celebratory zinger box. Could the computer be damaged in some way and maybe the added cooling of the AC helped? Well, I opened it up and everything looked perfect. I couldn't see any damage at all. And it turns out that me thinking the car was fixed by cooling the ECU was a complete coincidence and the issue still remains sadly. There's still a good chance that the idle speed control valve could be defective. So I cleaned out a spare one that was given to me along with the car. This one had a ton of carbon build up. I also cleaned out the one that was in the car once more. The spare valve even after cleaning idled way too high which is very dangerous. So I put the original one back in which didn't hang and also set at the correct idle speed. Both valves were clearly worn out either way so I'm installing a new one and as you can see it springs back as it's designed to. The old one not at all. My theory was that the solenoid in the valve was overheating and eventually became intermittent as it didn't sit open by default. I then reset the ECU, locate the fuse panel next to the steering wheel, then remove fuse 20. This 10 amp one here for a few minutes. Once the fuse is back in you can then start the car and run through the idle relearn procedure. This once again didn't fix the car, but hey, the coolant reservoir is looking pretty dirty and I can see some sort of sediment in there as well. Maybe it has something to do with the cooling system being blocked. To perform a coolant flush, first remove the protective cover under the front bar. This is held in place with several bolts all the way along the guard. And once I finally removed all of them, it came off. It'll definitely need a good clean. To drain the coolant, I had to disconnect the lower radiator hose held on with this clamp. The hose really didn't want to come off, and this liquid is supposed to be green. But after a lot of wiggling, the floodgates let loose a large amount of discolored coolant. Ah, yeah, this is not a good sign. That's quite a lot of sediment and what I assume is rust. There was pretty much exactly 8 litres in there, along with this yummy chocolate dust at the bottom. The next step was removing the top half of the coolant system. The bolts were extra tight, so I sprayed them with some WD-40. Using a much stronger tool, the bolts finally moved. And there's the thermostat, as orange as humanly possible. This car is definitely due for a thorough flushing. To remove the thermostat, all you've got to do is pry up on it. I'll be replacing it anyway after the flush, so I wasn't that careful. Now to begin the flush, I forced water through the radiator with a garden hose. The result was a nice warm batch of pumpkin soup. I flushed it again, still as bad as the last flush. You guessed it, I ran water through it again. Still not very clean at all. Still dirty, still dirty. Next I flush the coolant reservoir, which runs down through the radiator. Very much not how it's supposed to look. Literally three flushes later it was still very orange, and was filled with this sludge. Surely this couldn't have been good for the cooling system, right? After about the eighth reservoir flush it was looking somewhat clearer. It was probably a good idea to thoroughly clean out the container itself, which after disconnecting a few hoses was easy to remove. I started by running water through it with a hose. I then filled it with some dishwashing detergent and hot water, shaking it around and emptying it out several more times. 
While I let the dish soap work its magic, I also sprayed out the engine block itself. This definitely flushed out a lot of stuff, and after doing that three more times, the water was nearly clear. I ended up taking the reservoir tank inside and running hot water through it about 10 more times while shaking it around a lot. If this car was worth it, I would have put a new one in, but this should be fine. Now the next phase of the cleaning, running it through with some cooling system flush. I used half a bottle, then began filling the system with water. At around the 6 litre mark, the level reached the thermostat housing. I left it off so that I could be sure no air pockets were forming as I filled it. Then I could fill it up until it reached the minimum marker. I then started the engine with the heaters cranked up all the way. As the coolant began moving through the system, I kept topping it up until the level stopped dropping. The coolant pressure cap could now be screwed back on. I then let the engine run for a while as it warmed up. Remember to keep the heaters on full blast. This ensures any possible debris is flushed from the heater core. You'll know the coolant has warmed up when the top hose gets hot and feels like there's a lot of pressure inside. And after about 20 minutes of running, I let the car cool down. Then I released the coolant once again from the lower hose. It clearly removed quite a bit of stuff once again. This was simply water and 250 milliliters of cooling system flush before. Since I had half a bottle of the cooling flush left, I did the exact same thing again, filling it up, with the heaters running and chopping up the reservoir until full. Once again, the liquid came out rather orange. The flush was clearly removing a lot of scale and sludge buildup. Even after the second flush, there was still stuff like this coming out amazingly. So before putting in the final coolant, I flushed out the radiator, reservoir and engine block one last time with a hose. I then put half of the coolant in. This stuff is cheap, but given the state of the cooling system, you'd probably want to flush it again in a few months anyway. Followed by most of the water and finally the last half of the coolant. The car unsurprisingly ran a bit cooler now, but this still did not solve our original original issue. But all hope was not lost. Ben at Ultratune Golden Grove was kind enough to scan the car for me. It was kind of scary driving it up there as it began misfiring quite bad on the way. The one fault code his professional scan tool reported was P0340, camshaft position sensor fault. I hadn't heard of that part going bad, nor did I know that this car had such a sensor since it's a single cam engine. Either way, I made it back home. To stop the car stalling at the lights, I immediately put the car into neutral, applied the handbrake, and then revved up the engine to keep it going. I'd also like to thank Auto Pro at Golden Grove for supplying most of the parts used in this video. With a new cam sensor in hand, I began the installation, starting with the removal of the fan assembly at the front of the engine. With the connector and two 10mm bolts removed, it can be lifted up and out, with a lot of wiggling. I also checked that both fans do indeed spin and aren't damaged. And there is the camshaft position sensor. Just to the right of the crank angle sensor I replaced earlier in the video. The drive belt has to be removed, so be sure to make note of where the belt actually runs to. This car does thankfully have this shown under the bonnet. To remove tension on the belt, I levered the tensioner pulley and while not under tension, slipped the belt off. We've now got a pretty good view of the part. You'd really struggle to find this without prior knowledge. The next step is removing the idle attentioner pulley as we need access to the cover underneath. And after removing the single bolt, the cover comes off easily. Huh, that wire looks rather melted. To take the part out, I removed the single bolt underneath and popped it out. In the word of Jamie Heineman, well, there's your problem. This was clearly causing the issue, and with a dab of engine oil as lubricant, I slot the new part back into the hole. I made sure to clean off the small cover as well, being sure to straighten out where it was clearly damaging the previous part. With it all back together, it not only ran, but we'd actually fixed the problem. Now that we've solved the stalling issues, I think I should give the car a really good detailing and get into the interior. It wasn't too dirty inside, but there were a few things I wanted to do. First of all, a good vacuum. For such an old car with 260,000 kilometers, or about 160,000 miles, the interior wasn't horrible. The rear seats had clearly seen a lot of use, so I'd imagine it was a family car at one point. The rear floor mat is a single piece spanning the entire length of the footwell, which definitely benefit from a good hose down. A lot of the dials had dead skin built up on them, something some eucalyptus oil really helped remove. In fact, a lot of the general grubbiness came off with a bit of elbow grease. And while the front driver's seat was pretty bad, that's nothing a dirt cheap pair of seat covers can't fix. It ain't perfect, but it now runs like a dream. So there we have it, the Series 2 AU Falcon. A design that at the time was definitely not liked. However, I personally think it looks really cool. And with age, I think it's only getting better. Thank you very much for watching. I know this is a bit of a different video from what I usually post. And I hope you've enjoyed it because I might do one or two more of these this year. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you in another tech related video sometime soon. Have a good one.